So what we finished up with on Wednesday was how we get these first two layers of tissue to begin to develop and have sort of a, a, a different look, we call it differentiation. And we know that it comes down to the environment that it will be exposed to and how that environment triggers a different set of proteins to be turned on. And of course, proteins are working for the physiological function. So if we have two different sets of proteins turned on, we have two different types of physiology. And we begin to develop new mutations. What you can see through the rest of this figure here as we move along that more and more things start to happen. We get some new colors along the way. That's another tissue that's being developed. And really what's happening here, this process is going to be called later differentiation. And that's what we're going to pick up today with that later differentiation. And, and really what's happening with later differentiation is we're continuing to have these different environmental exposures depending on where we're located within the developing uh, embryo. We still have mitosis that's occurring, so cells are being produced from original cells, doubling the DNA, splitting it apart, and continuing daughter cells. And as we create more and more cells, they get clumped together in certain areas of this developing embryo, and we have new tissues that begin to arise. As we go through the differentiation process, and here this is about day 23, um, about two weeks from this point is when the heart will begin to beat. And you actually can see that on ultrasound within about the first five to six weeks after conception, which is really three to four weeks after you might know that you're pregnant. Right? Um, so that's tissue that now has new physiology the tissue up to this point couldn't contract. We now are going to begin to have tissue that can contract. So we're continually gaining these new functions from these tissues. So this is the later differentiation process. And really, this is going to be defined by two factors. How the tissue develops or differentiates is defined by two factors. The first factor should be pretty obvious. It's what proteins have been turned on or turned off. So what is the protein makeup of that particular cell? It's going to begin to help define what type of cell and tissue that cell can be incorporated into. The other thing that's going to focus or that's going to um, drive this later differentiation process is going to be the cell's physical history. In other words, we might have two different cells with very similar protein composition that you would think, oh, okay, so similar proteins, similar physiological function. But based off of their location, the two locations maybe had a completely different environmental exposure, different rates of CO2, different rates, rates of glucose availability at some time during the previous 23 days or the previous history of that organism or that individual. And that cell's physical history is going to determine also what that cell can become and what type of physiology that cell can begin to take on. So all of this with differentiation, whether it's early or late differentiation, results in meat protein unique protein exposure per cell. And that unique set of proteins, the composition of proteins within a cell, leads to unique function. Because these two things always go together, right? The proteins always define the function. Well, that unique function is actually what is going to define distinct tissues. In 
Now, if you kind of think back to uh, the first day or two that we are in this class, I gave you a hierarchical order. And we said cells, to tissues, to organs, to organ systems. If we have distinct tissues, we put together a group of distinct tissues and we get distinct organs. And then from those organs, we get the organ system, which eventually leads to the whole organ system. <clears throat> so really, to get the distinct organ systems, the 11 distinct organ systems, these cells have everything. The cell, the first cell, has everything that's required to respond to a variety of different environmental exposures that lead towards that cell being faded or targeted towards a specific type of tissue. And eventually we get to a point where we have three different tissues in the embryo. Uh, those three different tissues are going to give rise to the many different types of tissue that are required for humans. And as we go through that process of embryogenesis and then through ketogenesis up to birth, the whole process is about turning those primordial embryonic tissues into tissues that are going to be uh, usable as the individual is born and then beyond. And even the differentiation process that continues. Um, you're probably aware of little babies when they're born, the bones in the in the brain they have to be able to squish around, they have to be what we call malleable because they have to come out of a uh, birth canal. Send a bowling ball through a straw. Right? So it's good if we can collapse those tissues around um, the, the head of the baby and the baby uh, can be expelled from the birth canal. And you touch the top of the baby's head and there's a little soft spot. The differentiation process continues that little soft spot in the tissue called cartilage. And by the time they're about uh, 18 months to two years old, that cartilage is completely given away to a tissue called bone. So that differentiation process continues. Uh, eventually, that differentiation process transitions over to growth, and we take muscle tissue. It doesn't really change that much in its composition, but it begins to grow, and we add protein, we add additional um, structure for those cells. Okay, so baby is born, we have a human that's beyond the primordial embryonic stages, and they have tissue. And that tissue is organized into organs, which are organized into 11 different organ systems. So now it's time to begin to look at those organ systems in more detail and to discuss the anatomy and the physiological function, the function of those organ systems. And we're going to start out with the skeletal system. So if you want to start with a, a new new group of notes in your lecture, or a new, new group of uh, notes for this lecture, and you want to call it something, feel free to call it skeletal system, which is the proper name for which is the proper name for um, the organ system that's going to be made up of bones, ligaments, and cartilage. So the skeletal system really has three main purposes. And those three main purposes are to provide support, to provide protection, and to facilitate movement. To provide support, protection, and movement. All of our skeletal muscles attach to the skeleton, and it helps to keep everything where it's supposed to be. 
fight against the effects of gravity, that's called posture. Uh, we can keep our organs inside of the thoracic cavity. If it's a visceral organ, such as your heart, your lungs, your liver, we use the skeletal system to support that and keep that uh, those, those uh, organs protected behind the rib cage. The protection, obviously, would be very problematic if your heart wasn't protected by the rib cage at all. Um, and then movement or locomotion, the ability to run, walk, use tools, all of it's facilitated by the skeletal system with the assistance of skeletal muscle. Really, the movement in the skeletal system provides the articulation. You have these, your joints that help with the rotation of the ligaments and the segments of your body. The skeletal system is made up of three connective tissues. One of those tissues is bone, which is a hard supportive tissue. And we're going to come back and we're going to get into all three of these types of tissue here shortly. I'm just kind of introducing them, get you thinking in the right vein, and then we'll come back and deal with some of the more intricate details. So you have bone, ligaments, which is a fibrous tissue, ligaments are responsible to hold individual bones together. And then lastly is a tissue called cartilage. And cartilage is a collagen containing tissue. And we use cartilage to help reduce friction during movement or mobility. So bones, ligaments, and cartilage are the three tissues that make up the organs that make up uh, make up the organ system known as the skeletal system. That's the knee joint. Uh, and I'm showing you this picture because it helps to illustrate the three types of tissue that are present. The tibia, the patella, and the femur, those three bones, those classically would be defined as an organ. Each of them is an organ, so you have an organ called the tibia. It's a bone, and it's made up of bone tissue. In the knee joint itself, what holds these two uh, different bones together, the tibia and the femur, are these things here called ligaments. Anyone structure the ACL? Soccer player? Yeah. Always, always the female soccer players. ACL is a ligament that holds the knee together to keep the tibia, the femur, and the tibia. At the correct distance. Did they do the lock and drawer test? Uh, yeah. yeah, I did my ACL and my ACL. And you're at all the same time? Mm -hmm. Awesome. You were kicking a ball and someone came on the inside and you're like, yes. Mm -hmm. yep. That's the way it almost always happens. Um, Cartilage, we find that over the surface of the bones, what we would call the articular surfaces. So these are the places where those bones are going to rub together, so to speak. And we want to make sure that they get protected. I mean, you, you don't have to really do too much to understand that if this is how we moved and it was no protection. You do that for a while, you can't see up pretty good because of the friction. Imagine that that's the way that your bones were, and they didn't have that protection from the cartilage. You get up and you probably be fine for maybe the first hour of the day, but eventually that friction would be so overwhelming that you would I mean, you might as well be dead. So that cartilage is going to protect the, uh, the tips of the bones and allow 
that contact survey friction free for the most part. I mean, obviously, there's no such thing as a friction free surface, but very close to being friction free and also very smooth instead of real rigid movement. So as we jump in here, let's start off with the bones. And we'll talk about the bone, the, the bone tissue. Uh, and then we'll work our way up to a whole bone in anatomy, physiology, or half bone. Uh, anyone know what a composite material is? Anyone heard that term before? Okay. You like fish, anyone? You like fish? Every time you go fishing, you're using something that's made of a composite, or it's, it's a composite material. That's the fishing rod. Fishing rods are typically made up of some sort of flexible material, carbon fiber or graphite, and then some. Um, rigid material that makes it strong, and typically it's a fluid composite. So a composite material is taking two different materials, and you put them together to create a new type of material, but you gain or hold the original uh, uh, characteristics of the two materials that make up the, the new material. So in the fishing pole, you can have a fishing rod that is not only flexible, but it's also strong. And you get that strength from carbon fiber or graphite, I'm sorry, flexibility from carbon fiber or graphite, and then strength from the dry glue called the pox. Bones are actually going to be a composite material as well. Composite material, typically we think of composites being uh, the domain of engineering, structural engineering. Uh, and just simply don't overthink it. Composite materials are materials that contain two or more individual materials, and you gain the characteristics of both. Over here for our fishing rods, carbon fiber and epoxy. In bone, we're going to have a high calcium content. And really, it's a high content of minerals that contain calcium. And those calcium-contained minerals provide rigidness. So that's one of our materials. The other material is a material called spongy tissue. And what that tissue does is it provides flexibility and living function. So we have in our bones materials that allow the bone to be rigid, yet flexible and living. What you're looking at here are actually the two different materials. And then put together, you get a bone. So you have spongy tissue. That's actually spongy tissue. It looks like a sponge that maybe you wash your dishes with. Uh, and the spongy tissue is very flexible. Hard to take it out, show you I can flex it around just like this piece of paper. That's calcium. And the minerals, minerals that can contain calcium, they form crystals. And those crystals are very rigid, very strong. But they become really, really rigid. Really, really brittle. I don't know what rigid means. Really brittle. So if I take a bone, um, I can actually treat the bone to remove either of these, and then we can observe what happens. When you remove the rigidness, that bone is left over and you can tie it in the bone. Because it's so flexible. And flexible. Can you imagine trying to stand up on that type of a bone? It's going to be uh, like an octopus. If we get rid of the sponginess, sponginess and we're just left over with basically the, the shell or the, the mineral composition, you put the bone down on the table and cap it with a hammer and just completely shatters because it's so brittle. But you take both of those, put it together, and you create a bone that is strong, but it's flexible. So when I jump, I don't break my bones because I have that flexibility. I have the ability for the the compression, the compressive forces to, to absorb the, the, the shock of the jump from the top. Um, but at the same time, if I get kicked in the leg and playing soccer or something like that, I don't shatter my bones because I have the rigidness from the calcium. 
So that composite material is really nice. Plus, it gives me the living function now that I'm required so that I can actually do all sorts of different physiological things. And some of the physiological things we're going to talk about here in just a second, but a lot of it is centered around keeping <coughs> track of the chemical composition of your blood. Bones are responsible to produce red blood cells, and bones are responsible to generate uh, the proper calcium concentration inside of your bloodstream, which calcium is required for a lot of different physiological functions. So bone is a composite material, and out of that composite material, we get bone-specific functions. And these bone-specific functions, just hit on a few of them. One is to act as a mineral depository. <coughs> So your bones have cellular systems where these minerals can be packed into the bone or they can be pulled out of the bone when they're needed. So we allow immediate access Minerals and the two minerals, the two big minerals that we need, we've already hit on calcium. Calcium is really important. And then another mineral called phosphate. Phosphate is PO4. 3 minus, minus 3, because it's a negative charge. So 3 more electrons than protons. It doesn't really matter. Just know that we need calcium and we need phosphate. And if we store those two chemicals in the, in the, in the bones, and we can call, them, call those chemicals out of the bone to enter into the bloodstream to be used in other locations in the body. The other important function is blood production. So we have blood producing capabilities. Uh, you're all probably aware that there's a tissue inside a bone called marrow. And it's our bone marrow where our red blood cells are going to be um, initially synthesized or generated, allowed to. Uh, go through a maturation process and then they enter into the bloodstream. Um, once they enter into the bloodstream, those red blood cells are primarily going to be uh, aiding in the regulation of pH of the blood and also oxygen carrying capacity. So drugs that stimulate the red marrow of bone to increase blood cell production, those are ergogenic aids. One of those is EPO, which we've heard of EPO before. Uh, it's a hormone of rhizopoietin, and that is one of the uh, more common blood doping drugs that's used by clinical nurse athletes, especially cyclists. One of the side effects of EPO use, excessive EPO use, is it causes the heart to have to compensate for thicker blood. You put more red blood cells into, uh, into the blood, it makes the blood more viscous. Think of motor oil, it's a stickier substance. It's harder to circulate, so the left ventricle begins to increase its tissue size and have an increase in muscle mass. And the heart really only can grow in one way, and that's in. And so as the heart grows in, you have your left ventricle begin to decrease in size. Back during the 90s, there were several Tour de France style, long distance style cyclists who died. And they died because of that form of blood doping that had heart attack. 36 years old, that's how old I am right now. I've never had a heart attack, I'm not going to fly That was really a good side, though, wasn't it? <laughs> now I say that to say, don't blood go.
there are two types of bone tissue that we find inside of a bone. Both of them are made up of spongy tissue and that uh, calcium containing the minerals, calcium containing minerals. Uh, they just happen to be in different concentrations. You can see that uh, the outside of the bone is this very uh, thick, doesn't look very spongy type of bone, and we call that compact bone. It actually still has the spongy tissue, but it has a much higher concentration of mineralization. On the inside of the bone, this material is called spongy bone, and there just happens to be less of that mineral tissue, so we get the spongy appearance. And this allows blood vessels and lymphatics and nervous system to work its way through the bone. So those are our two types of bone tissue, compact bone and that compact bone is made up of several different cells. And this shouldn't surprise you because we're talking about tissue and all by definition the tissues are made up of different types of cells. So this tissue called compact bone has several different types of cells and I want to kind of give you a look at structure and the makeup, the appearance of bone. Bone cells, and there are three types. One of them are called osteocytes. Remember, CYTE is a good indication that we're talking about cells. Osteo refers to the fact that we're dealing with bone. Another name for bone tissue is osteo tissue. So osteocytes are these bones that help to maintain the mineralization of the spongy tissue or the spongy bone, the spongy um, bone tissue. <coughs> and the way that they get organized, and I'm going to draw this in just a second, you're also going to see this in lab today. We have osteocytes, and several of these osteocytes come together and they form this structure called an osteon. And when we look microscopically at the bone, we have a primary circular structure. So here is a, a picture of what that looks like um, in, in detail. So this is our osteon. And when we draw an osteon, we just simply draw these concentric circles. Those layers, those are called lamellae. So the individual layers are called lamellae. Embedded in those layers, you're going to have sort of these little open spots. You can see them here as well. In a cell prep, the cell is actually not there anymore. Remember, we usually kill the tissue, so to speak, when we prepare it for microscope observation. So what's left over is where the osteocyte lives so to speak, before the prep, the bone was pressed. And those look like small, um, they look like small little caverns. They're called lacunae. That's what's from the LA. Lacunae, this is a U, and then this is another A. So the lamellae are the layers, the lacunae are the little caverns where the cell used to exist. And then we have these tiny little kind of canals that go throughout the, um, uh, throughout the, the, the whole osteum. And those tiny little canals <coughs> allow the individual osteocytes that really are secluded, right? They're trapped inside of these little lacunae and are surrounded by mineralized tissue. And we get these tiny little canals that help each individual osteocytes be able to communicate with neighboring osteocytes. Those little tiny canals, the, the term there, I'm going to spell it out first. It's actually it's right there. I'm going to spell it in the plural. You can see the word canal in there. 
that word is pronounced cannuliculi. And it kind of sounds like can I lick your eye? So can you lick your eye? Hopefully that'll help you remember that. So lamellae are the layers, lacunae are the open sites, the osseous, where the osteocytes hang out. Canuliculi are these little canal-like structures between everything, and then right in the middle of an osteocyte, of an osteon, I should say, is a structure. It goes by two names. The best name to give it is the central canal, but you may also see it referred to as the Haversian canal. Haversian was actually the guy who first characterized bone, and biologists are really arrogant. We like to make things after ourselves. So the Haversian canal. It's called an ipanem, which is a structure that's named for a person. And we actually learned a few ipanems in anatomy. Um, the Haversian canal is one of those. But they've all been changed, and there's actually a non ipanem name. So a name that's not based off of some guy's name that is a little more descriptive, which we know essentially in this case. So this is the primary structure. In compact bone, what you would see is you would see other osteon that sort of get packed together to form this overall compact bone structure. This central canal, by the way, that's where we have nervous system Mas uh, vasculation and lymphatic supply into the bone. And yes, your bones are actually really demanding of blood and really demanding of nervous system supply. So we have a big system uh, of canals in the middle of the osteon where all of those uh, vessels and, and nerves can get permeated into the bone and then capillary beds kind of feed off of that central canal into certain locations within. What was the last note that you had? Osteocytes, several forms of osteocytes. So, right below that, that central canal that I just identified forms at the center of the osteocyte. Access to the vessels and the nerves, so we can have vessel and nervous supply, blood and lymphatic and nervous supply into, into the bone. So that's compact bone. In the middle here of our bones, all sides compact, and it's all of these osteons really tightly packed together. When you get into the spongy bone, what you actually begin to see is an individual osteon sort of forms these stick-like structures or lattice-work-like structures. Okay, so if I take a cross-section to this guy right here, I find a single osteon. Right here, a single osteon. So, spongy bone forms this lattice. These small little beams, I'm talking about these structures in here, you can see these are kind of small little beams of the lattice. Those are called trabeculae. So we get these small little beams or trabeculae that are interspersed throughout space. So trabeculae and then open space. And it's that open space that ends up being filled up with vessels, and bone marrow, and nervous system supply, etc. Okay? So the inside of the bone, there's actually a much higher concentration of vessels and blood supply there. There's still a decent amount of blood flow 
in the compact mode, but not near as much as we find here in the sludgy mode. And that's just in terms of because we have now some open space to allow those vessels and everything to work their way through. So the, the spongy tissue forms these osteo, uh, osteogenic type structures, the osteon. And then we have mineralization that kind of encases everything, but leaves some of the space open so that uh, we have the access to vessels and all of that. Clear as mud, right? It's going to be the marrow that we find filling the space between the trabecular, the lattice work of the spongy bone, that contains our stem cells for blood. By the way, that term stem cell, I'm not referencing embryonic stem cells, those are a type of stem cells. But in the adult, we have a variety of cells that can give rise to certain types of tissue. And one of those just happens to be stem cells that can give rise to blood. We call them hematopoietic stem cells. Okay, so once we get up to the level of the whole bone, comprised of spongy tissue, or spongy bone rather, and um, compact bone, we get up to the level of the bone, and anyone who happen to know how many bones we have to be five. Two hundred and six, plus or minus two. So some people have slightly more. There's a couple bones that some people have that most people don't have, and they're really just small little bones that we find. They're called sesamoid bones, and they end up in certain locations um, in the hand. So we're going to say 206 bones. That's 206 individual organs. Biologists are really, really good at classifying things to keep, our, to keep ourselves organized. Bones are no exception. We classify bones into four different categories. One category is called the long bones. And long bones are going to include the bones that we find in the limbs. So these three bones of the arm, these bones, three bones of the legs, and then most of the bones that we find in the digits or in the fingers. So not necessarily the bones of the wrist or the ankle, but rather the bones that are right here in the palm and then that are in the fingers. So I'm just going to call those the digits. Why do you call them long bones? Because they're long. We're so creative as biologists. That bone's long. I'm going to call it a long bone. The next grouping are the flat bones. And the flat bones are going to be the bones that are flat, and they're going to include bones of the skull. We're also going to have the sternum, or what you might call the breastbone, and then your 24 ribs. So those are going to be our flat bones because they're overall flat appearance. We also have short bones. And the short bones are going to be bones that really are more of a cuboidal shape or um, not really the elongated shape of the bone. Uh, so these are going to be the bones that we find here in the ankles and then also up here in our wrists. So those are three categories. I did say there's a fourth. I can only be convinced that the fourth category is just simply because people got really lazy. You know, like, well, long bones, flat bones, short bones. The fourth category is irregular bones. After you distribute all the bones into one of these first three categories, any bone that's left over that's not really long, not really short, not really flat, 
we just say, okay, they're ir irregular. So there are sun bones. Here's an example of one. Uh, it's a vertebrae that's irregular in shape. It doesn't really have any of the characteristics for being long, flat, or short. Uh, there's also some bones up here in the face that are pretty weird looking. One of them is the sphenoid bone. It kind of looks like a bat. I don't know why we just said the bat. Pretty awesome, actually. So we got the vertebrae and the bones of the pelvis, so there's a pelvic girdle, and then some of our uh, some of our skull bones. Sphenoid and there's also a bone in there called the ethmoid, which is pretty crazy looking as well. Okay, I just told you, so here's your first quiz of the day. How many bones in the ultimate? 206. Sounds like everybody just passed. At birth, there's actually a large uh, increase, close to 300 bones. And what it is, is you have bones in the skull that fuse together as you move towards adulthood. It's like one bone. Uh, and you're no longer, uh, you no longer have the multiple bones that make up that, that individual. Individual bone. So in the adult, 206. Now, I've given you the classification of all of these bones. Uh, we've also ordered them anatomically. And you may remember that old childhood song, the bones bones, right? That's the anatomical order. How do they actually relate to each other anatomically? Leg bones are connected to the ankle bones. The ankle bones are connected to the lower digital bones, the phalanges and the, and the, and the metatarsals. Um, so the anatomical order really is the skeleton. <coughs> and when we look at the skeleton, this particular figure here that you're looking at has colored the skeleton either in purple or in green. Collectively, the whole thing's called the skeleton. But then as you begin to look at the purple bones and then the green bones, those are going to be kind of the subcategories or subunits of the skeleton. The first subunit is the appendicular skeleton. And maybe you can pull from that word appendage, which may help for you to understand that it's what's in purple here, which is going to be the upper limbs and then the lower limbs, including the bones that girdle or attach those limbs to the rest of the skeleton. So the appendicular skeleton, we have two, two different sections. The upper limbs are attached to the pectoral girdle. So the pectoral girdle, scapula and clavicle, and then all of the bones here of the arm, humerus, radius, ulna, and then the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. The lower portion of the epidemic skeleton includes the pelvic girdle. And the bones of the lower limb. Now notice that the back side here, this bone right here, there's actually uh, a number of bones in there that are fused together now, so they usually treat them as one, but you can still see individually where they were as a child. That's Partially, you call that your tailbone. It's going to include the sacrum and the coccyx. Those bones are what girdle the pelvis and the lower limbs to the rest of this skeleton shown here in green. So that's going to be the pelvic girdle and the lower limb. This is not include what's shown here in green. That's actually going to be part of the other, uh, other part of the skeleton, the subunit there. 
what's called the axial, what I would call the axial, because it's right in the middle, and it takes the axial of the body. So the axial skeleton, this particular subunit, is going to include the bones that we find in the head and in the spine, all of our vertebrae, including the sacral vertebrae and the coccyx. And then the bones here that make up uh, our rib cage, which I'm going to just simply refer to as the bones of the torso. Okay, so extending from those subunits, I want to just categorize all the bones that are located here in the middle of of the skeleton, the axial skeleton. By the way, why am I doing this? And I'll give you a hint. If you know bone anatomy, you can get a lot further on the rest of the anatomy. The bone that's right here in the um, in the skull, right at the front that, uh, that we would call the forehead, that bone there is called the frontal bone. That frontal bone is covered up by a muscle. That muscle is now going to be called travis. So by knowing the bones, you can be actually begin to, to overlay the other anatomical features of other organ systems. Because you may sort of get the thing. How is that a general rule? No. But knowing the bones and their names and their locations helps with a lot of other anatomy when you're going through to look at humans. So axial skeleton. In the skull, which I'm going to include really the whole thing in the skull, both the cranial bones, the bones that make up the top, and then the facial bones, the bones that are located in the face. I'm going to just collectively call those the skull. There are a total of 25 bones in your skull. And now some of them have three pieces. The frontal bone, there's no reason. The frontal bone is just one frontal bone. But on the side of the skull, there's a bone on both sides that's called the temporal bone. Um, we have other bones, zygomatic, there's a, 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 an arch right here on the side of the face on both sides. It's named the same, you would obviously have a right zygomatic and a left zygomatic bone. So there's going to be, of these 25 sub repeats, at least repeats in terms of their anatomical features and then the naming convention. Right in the middle here is the vertebral column. At the very top, there are two vertebrae that I want you to know by, by name. They are cervical vertebrae, but they are named um, Atlas and Axis. Atlas is the Greek god who holds up the world on his shoulder. Atlas is the bone that articulates with the bones of the skull. So it's one the big dome sits on top of it, on top of the vertebral column. Atlas is right below. It's the next vertebrae down. And it has this little pin that sits up. So Atlas kind of looks like a circle. Axis has this little pin and it's articulation. So they can move it there. So we have seven cervical vertebrae. By the way, we name all of these basically just with a C, one through C, seven. C, one is Atlas. C, two is Axis. Okay, so vertebral column is seven cervical vertebrae. And then we have thoracic vertebrae. These thoracic vertebrae articulate with our ribs. There's a total of 12 of those. The lumbar, this is the lower back, five lumbar vertebrae. In your car, you might have lumbar support. Pump that thing up, push it on kind of a small at the back, if you will. So those five vertebrae there. <coughs> Sacral is this kind of triangular shaped bone here. And I, I wrote 5F there. The F stands for fused. It's really just one bone. Originally, there were five. 
they're in um, uh, embryogenesis, uh, no, I'm sorry, not embryogenesis, uh, fetal development and then into either for yeah, those five bones that are used together. Thoracic, T H O R A C I C. And then uh, last, what we'll do, we'll do with here today, your tailbone, which is properly called the coccyx, and that's going to be a four ass, four views. So we'll pick up there on Monday. Um, we got two more bones to categorize here in the axials, and we're going to be ready to start up and talk about those Monday.